Uh, okay, so I want to uh, introduce and welcome our speaker today, and that is Waverly Ray, who is uh, uh, teaching here at Mesa in Geography. And uh, we will not be able to enjoy her company much longer because she is moving to uh, Texas uh, already here in um, you know, by next semester, where uh, she will be pursuing a uh, doctoral program in geography at Texas State. So we wanted to make sure that we snagged her before she left. And uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, her accomplishments, uh, she was very modest. She didn't think that I should mention anything. But it turns out that she has published in uh, the International Journal. She's in, uh, attended uh, several international conferences, uh, among uh, others, this year only in Chile and Switzerland. So this is somebody who is absolutely at the, um, uh, at the cutting edge of, uh, of her profession. And she will be going places in more ways than one. So uh, her, the title of her talk is Think Globally, Teach Locally, A Geographer's Tale. I want to welcome Waverly Wade. Thank you, thank you, Nina. I appreciate those words. And um, she makes it sound so wonderful, but the reality is that I study geography because it's an excuse to travel. That's my, my real passion, right, is seeing the world. Um, I was always curious about places, and that got me in a lot of trouble as a young person. And then when I realized that you can study geography and, and have other people um, pay for your travel internationally, that's when I, I figured I, I found something good for me. So um, thinking globally, teaching locally, and I'm going to talk about my tale today, but I hope you share your experiences, um, and if you have any questions during the talk, do let me know. Um, so we live in a, in a complex, highly interdependent world, uh, whether it be uh, the clothes we buy, uh, the food we eat, the cars we drive, uh, whether it's um, uh, our own family histories, tracing outside of the United States and how it shapes our identities. This all uh, makes uh, globalization and understanding international perspectives important. Okay, That's my hypothesis to you today. I hope you, uh, by the end of it, support uh, this idea. Uh, before we get started, I just thought I'd go over what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'm going to talk about global education. Is this a term we've heard before? Raise your hand. Global education. So we're going to have a little bit of background on that. Also, uh, cultural competence. So I'm going to be talking about what that means. Is that a term we've heard? And I guess I should interject that uh, I, I'm guilty of being an, an education um, student. And so I use a lot of uh, education speak, so I'll be making up some words today for you, and um, uh, this term might be one of them. Uh, here's another one, internationalization. Okay, I'll be talking about that. This is really the, the um, key pieces of my research uh, as a geographer. Uh, and in particular, uh, international collaboration. So my area of uh, expertise is uh, bringing students, uh, undergraduate students in geography in the United States and pairing them with um, students in China or in Germany or in Chile where they can learn geography online. The idea here is that uh, you can learn more about the one-child policy in China from a student in China rather than me giving a formal lecture on it. So that's the idea. And then hopefully we'll have time for a discussion uh, towards the end. Uh, I just wanted to talk about what geography is because that's all, all often a puzzle for some people. Uh, we have human geography in this uh, bubble here, and this is where geographers look at languages and religions uh, in the world and, and other economies and things like that. Uh, we have physical geography, and this is where geographers will look at ecosystems, uh, we'll look at um, coasts or deserts, so the landscape is a, a part. Um, the meeting in the middle here, uh, we call it the human environment interaction, and so um, a geographer studying the human environment interaction would look at global climate change or the impact of the fires on the ecology and the economy of um, uh, uh, California. And so um, this is geography in the nutshell, but really what I'm interested in uh, is geographic education. And so ge geographic educators, uh, we want to understand how people think spatially. Uh, so how many of you have a good sense of direction? <clears throat> OK, so uh, I wouldn't have raised my hand there because my sense of direction is horrible. So geographic educators would want to look at me and figure out why that is. Uh, why there might be a gender difference between um, uh, spatial abilities. Uh, ge geographic educators would also um, kind of think about what is important to study. How many of you have taken a geography class? Okay, was it memorizing uh, states' capitals and state names and country capitals? Uh, well, for me as a geographic educator, I don't think that's very important, right? That's a, a base understanding. Uh, but for me, geography is much more than that. It's not only understanding where things are, but why they're there and what the implications are. Uh, so that's my 
um, background as a geographic educator, uh, and again, you know, trying to figure out not only what should be studied, um, but how students learn geography. Um, so, still thinking about geography, I want to just have this imagination here. Uh, imagine visiting a country where there are more than two guns for every three people, which suffers 45 murders and manslaughters a day, which has 70 active militias and 16,000 gangs in 800 cities. This is for the criminal justice major back there, I guess. Uh, uh, which has been at war with someone for most of its existence, and where the elected president has a one in four chance, historically, of being killed, wounded, or shot at. Is anyone uh, going to get their visa application to go to this country? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and, and you actually don't need one, right, because we're talking about the United States. Um, uh, here and so uh, you know I think geography is ultimately about changing your perspective on the world we live in uh, and so um, to have that background this next next few slides um, this is coming from worldmapper.org and uh, they've changed the shape of uh, different countries based on some um, piece of data can anyone guess what this might represent population Population. Okay, Ken, the geographer can no longer answer the rest of these questions. <laughs> uh, and actually, that's population. So we see uh, China and India well enlarged uh, to represent their um, uh, the two largest countries in population. How about this one? Any guesses um, coming Pollution. from someone other than Ken? Sorry. Pollution. Pollution. Energy consumption. Energy consumption. And this is a, a more random one. Those are both really good guesses. But here we have toy imports. <laughs> and so obviously toy imports are, are showing, you know, we have a very uh, a disposable income. Uh, and you can see, you know, Africa very skinny there, um, very little in South America. But of course, the United States uh, having a lot of problems right now with the toy imports. Uh, how about this one? Any ideas? I think this goes along with what uh, we've already heard, and this is fuel consumption. And I guess it's when we go out to buy our toys, right, we have to drive our cars to purchase them. So maybe there's a, a relationship there. Uh, we have fuel consumption. And this, the last one here on that same, no one wants to take a guess anymore. We have a carbon dioxide emission. So of course, you know, these maps aren't going to change too much. There's definitely going to be a relationship there uh, spatially. And now, just the last one on a, on a separate topic. Any guesses? Ken, how about you? We'll, we'll bring you back into the throes. Thanks. What's that? I said thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, and this is actually um, uh, international immigrants. So, you know, I started the, the talk by saying that we, you know, we live in a globalized world. The global economy is a driving force right now. Uh, but we can't forget, um, you know, we don't have to look at it at a global scale, right? We can look at just at a national scale or even a, a local scale to see um, uh, how the international immigrants into the United States changes um, the, the country that we live in. So uh, getting back, so now we have this context of geography. Uh, and I want to talk about global education because uh, this is a, a new term for some of us here. Uh, and it's uh, learning to understand and appreciate our neighbors, who have different cultural backgrounds from ours. And of course, as a geographer, I would say, you know, maybe the neighbors mean your next door neighbor, maybe it means the, uh, a neighboring country or even a neighbor around the world. Uh, uh, to see the world through the eyes and minds of others uh, and to realize that other people of the world need and want much of the same things. And this is uh, coming from the literature Thai in uh, 91. Uh, so this is a background of global education. Are these lofty goals? What do we think? It might be hard to measure the success of this, uh, but uh, my role as a geographic educator dealing with internationalization is to try to measure this. Uh, try, when we have students work together, we're trying to see, did perspectives change? Uh, was there any benefit for bringing students um, from different countries together? Um, and of course, it's all coming back into the, the fabric of globalization. Uh, and here I want to make my, uh, another argument here that we have increased technology you know, we can get uh, online and we can fly to anywhere in the world uh, with global travel, uh, with economic integration, uh, and environmental interdependence. Uh, with all of these factors of globalization working together, uh, there seems to be an increased demand for knowledge about other societies and cultures. Do we think that's true? Um, 
Uh, I, I mean, I, certainly I do, and I'm, I'm glad I'm seeing some people shaking their heads yes. Uh, but the reality is when we're talking about globalization, we're talking about uneven power structures, uh, we're talking about um, very uh, conflicting opinions, and so it's not always an easy road when we, when we travel down this, uh, and especially in globalization, uh, it's not an easy road. We have language uh, problems uh, when we try to bring students together. Um, it makes it very difficult. Anyone know where this picture was taken? Any guesses? Was it the back country of San Diego? Any thoughts? Uh, this is coming from uh, Papua New Guinea. And uh, my students in a cultural geography class uh, corresponded with students in Papua New Guinea. It was a really interesting experience. We were talking about nationalism and how people identify with the countries they live in. And uh, it was interesting because you know, Papua New Guinea has uh, the, the highest amount of linguistic diversity in the world. And so um, my, my colleague down there was teasing uh, us Californians about not being able to resolve uh, having dual languages taught in the schools where in Papua New Guinea in his class, he might have, um, in a class of 40 students, he would probably have you know, uh, people that could speak 200 different languages because uh, they're so multilingual. And Anyway, so uh, my point here, globalization, it's, it can be a bumpy road. International collaborations, that's not always easy. You have time zone differences and so on, but I think it's well worth it because of that background. We need to know more about the world we live in. Uh, cultural comp competence, so I have, haven't sold you yet on international perspectives. I want to try to sell you now on cultural competence uh, and really uh, being able to communicate and interact on the campus, in your workplace, and so on. Uh, so cultural knowledge, uh, a familiarization, uh, familiarization uh, with selected cultural characteristics, history, values, belief systems, and behaviors of the members of another ethnic group. So this cultural knowledge, is, this goes beyond just um, um, you know, uh, being aware of something. But this is actually giving you real pieces of knowledge that you know another ethnic group's histories. Uh, we also do have, a, a, this is coming actually from the healthcare uh, literature, uh, Adams and also in uh, 95. Uh, we have cultural awareness uh, component here, uh, developing a sensitivity and understanding of another ethnic group, uh, and which is interesting to me that it usually involves an international internal change uh, in terms of attitudes and values. So not only are we learning this uh, knowledge, but we're actually in the process changing our own attitudes and values um, towards others, which is an interesting component. And then um, to put these two pieces, knowledge and awareness together, uh, we're, we're building cultural skills, and so this is the, the competency to effectively operate in different cultural contexts. Um, and so you put these together and uh, you sort of have this uh, grinding wheel of your, of your uh, knowledges, your skills, and your awareness. Okay, so uh, I think we see this on uh, Mesa College's campus, the, the increasing um, need for multicultural awareness. Uh, but we're going to come back to Mesa in one second. I just want to talk about uh, internationalization, this messed up, made up world, word uh, of an, uh, incorporating uh, world views into all levels of uh, education. So seeing that there's a demand for uh, students who have uh, skills to work in different ethnic groups, maybe to work with people from different countries, uh, perhaps the company that our future, our current students will work at uh, will be owned by a European or a South American or a Chinese. Uh, person, so there's this idea that there's a necessity uh, to integrate these uh, worldviews into education, and it really goes from mission statements on college campuses to course outlines. So from the from your uh, broad uh, campus um, purpose uh, into your day-to-day -day learning in the classroom, um, and there's many different methods to internationalize. Uh, we can select readings not published in the United States. Uh, for the teachers here, do, or for the uh, professors here, I should say, do we do that already? Is it, an, is it a need to? Uh, it's interesting, I, um, I, uh, in one of my classes I um, handed out uh, articles in class that were published in the United Kingdom, and I went around to the different groups and asked the students you know, what they thought of it, and one student said, you know, it's interesting, but it's horribly misspelled. And I thought, for me, that was a, kind of a funny thing to realize, well, Actually, it's not misspelled, if anything, the way that we see it is misspelled uh, with the British English. Um, but this is one way to sort of broaden uh, a student's perspective, having them look at materials not from the United States. Of course, inviting guest speakers is a, a one way to broaden 
um, uh, what your, your topics are. We can promote international campus-based activities in our classrooms. Uh, and of course, student-faculty exchanges um, is, a, is an option, either study abroad or visiting professorships or one other way uh, to internationalize. Um, but well, let's think more about this internationalization. Uh, but, and uh, research by the American Council on Education, um, this was a, a study just done a few years ago in 2004, uh, and um, they realized that there is in limited international content in undergraduate curriculum in the United States. Uh, they cited limited support for internationalization on college campuses in the United States. Uh, whether it be uh, financial resources or even when faculty members are uh, up for promo promotion, do they consider um, international activities as part of, part of the tenure review? Um, less than 3% of undergraduates uh, study abroad. It's in, really, it's just not possible for so many of our students. Uh, and also, um, since the 1970s, there has not been an increase in foreign language enrollments. They've just remained steady. So even as our economy continues to globalize, um, perhaps we're, we're missing some of our key targets into integrating international perspectives into the classroom. Uh, and of course, for a geographer interested in international collaborations, this idea that you don't have to study abroad to, um, to gain international perspectives, that hopefully you can do it on your own campus using internet technologies. Um, my research uh, as a master's student at Texas State uh, had to do with a project for the American Council on Education. The American Council on Education got a, a Carnegie grant uh, and worked with the Association of American Geographers as well as um, the Political Science Organization, the History Association, I think I'm forgetting one, and one other discipline, psychology. Uh, they got these um, disciplines all together and they said, okay, create learning outcomes that will internationalize your discipline. We have some uh, political scientists, uh, historians, uh, their effectiveness in, in getting these learning outcomes down to the, to the actual instructors is questionable, but this was the goal. And the, the goal that we had as geographers was to see how internationalized we really were. Geography already has a focus that's international. But the reality is that how we teach it often has a very American flavor to it, a very um, specific um, focus. So the idea is to see how internationalized our, our ge discipline of geography is. Um, and we did find uh, obstacles to international collaborations in geography, uh, including something that scares me, and that's that scarce travel funding, right? Uh, in my experience, attending international conferences is the best way for me to have a broader understanding of what's going on in other countries in geographic education. Uh, they cited a lack of institutional support uh, for international activities, and that again goes back to tenure reviews and things like that. Uh, and a lack of international contact. So many geographers said they would want to collaborate internationally, but they just didn't know who was out there to do it. And so um, for my doctoral program, I'm going to be looking at how we can build a network of international geographers. Uh, I, I joke that we're going to develop a dating service for academics. That could get pretty interesting. But anyways, to be able to tie someone um, you know, from another country to um, an American campus. And the, the, I told you about the collaboration in Papua New Guinea. And I met the instructor there just haphazardly um, at a conference in Australia. Okay, and so that was... Uh, a, a way that I could build that contact. And what's interesting to me, too, is I had funding to go there. That instructor paid for it out of his own pocket. And so it really um, makes it very difficult, um, difficult endeavor to, to build these contacts. But that's what we're going to hope to do. Um, anyone had an opportunity to read Mesa College's mission statement as of late? <laughs> Has anyone ever read it? I took the opportunity to. And uh, while the American Council on Education found that only one in three campuses in, in the United States has an international component to it, it we did find it, or at least I think I found it, uh, in uh, San Diego Mesa College's mission statement. So if you're ever questioned by anyone, why would you want to put an international perspective? Well, here it is for you. Uh, and we're talking about here student success. And this, uh, this success includes critical thinking, communication, self-awareness and interpersonal skills, personal actions and civic responsibility, and my favorite, global awareness uh, and technolo technological awareness here. 
Uh, also, just to underscore where we find it in our own mission, uh, where there's personal and civic responsibility, uh, awareness of the physical, social, and behavioral sciences as they affect one's participation in the diverse local and global community. So understanding our role in the world, not only locally, um, but also globally. Uh, so I'm just going to give you an example of what this international collaboration looks like. Uh, I uh, was employed by the Center for Global Geography Education, and we developed modules uh, to allow instructors to come to pick the module, uh, to have someone to coordinate with to learn geography. The modules currently are in migration, nationalism, the global economy, and population. And so here's the home page for these modules. Um, again, for in the next uh, four years, we'll be working to update these to integrate um, these modules into uh, a really dynamic um, website. Uh, but here's the, the one on population. Initially, they were in uh, English and Spanish. We're hoping to have them translated to uh, Mandarin, Chinese, and Arabic. Um, so here are the lessons. They're inquiry-based lessons. Uh, lesson one, where in the world is the human population changing? Uh, and so students would come here online, read the content, and then get on a discussion board with their international students, their international team members, uh, to learn about population. So I thought we'd just walk through what this is. Uh, for lesson two, uh, we looked at how uh, population uh, change is linked to economic development. Uh, and then working in international teams, students explore the demographic transitions in rural and urban China. And so they would end up developing a map, a core cleft map like this, uh, to look at those population changes in China. Uh, when my students did it, we actually had a three-way collaboration. We had students um, at AmeriCosta College, students at uh, Beijing Normal University in China. We had students in Germany at um, the uh, University of Education there. Uh, and so we actually had three different countries participating, looking at population change in China. Um, then the students collect data to analyze the age stru sex structure of populations in different regions. Uh, and here's our friend, the population pyramid at different locations in the world. And then finally, the, the, the ending piece is always that discussion uh, of uh, what students learn through their mapping and the population pyramids. And this example is actually from um, students who uh, participated in a trial uh, season of this uh, module. We had about 600 students in 10 countries um, participating in the module. Um, at that point, they were paired. In this example, we paired um, students in the United States with students in Eritrea and East Africa. Uh, the group in the United States the, um, said, I think the actions of individual nations are important for balancing population growth. Uh, and so the Eritrea group said, well, wait a minute, the theory shows that population growth rates stabilize with economic development, which is closely connected with international cooperation. And so here we're getting some you know, different perspectives on this discussion board. And uh, as a master's student, I read all these um, hundreds of discussions to see where we were getting those international perspectives in what students were writing about. And so that's the goal. Um, Nina mentioned that I had gone to Chile earlier um, uh, this year, and here I am with um, both uh, Chilean professors, American professors, um, some Argentines as well, Brazilian, uh, as well as uh, students from the United States in Chile. And so we got all together for one weekend in uh, Pisco Alki, which I don't know if you know, Pisco is a liquor. Both Peru and uh, Chile uh, say it's their own. Um, but anyway, this town was called Pisco Alki. So that gives you an idea of what the weekend looked like. Uh, but um, here we are, and what I thought was really interesting about this particular collaboration was that, um, hold on, was that students and faculty members worked together. We actually had undergraduate students working with us to develop a curriculum. And it was really great because undergraduate students often had the best ideas for um, what, how we can have students have different perspectives in geography. And I just throw this in there because this is the largest bottle of wine I've ever seen. Um, and it's a chibombo in um, Chilean uh, terms here. And um, of course, that's the most fun for me, right, is not only being able to travel internationally, but to, to see all these new things. 
that I, I've never seen before. Um, so I just thought we'd take a minute um, to, to get together and have a talk. You know, how do we have international perspectives in our classes? Um, or or, or do, we, do we think it's important? And if we do, what, what kinds of things could be done? Does anyone, how about, I'd like to hear from the students really. Um, is this something that you're concerned about, being, um, having uh, knowledge about other countries? Do you see yourself working for a company um, that's going to be requiring you to travel internationally? Well, I'm going to be, I was thinking of doing graphic design for, one of, for my major, and a lot of that stuff usually involves going overseas to different, like, like Japan, if I was doing video games, or other countries do movies and stuff, so, I mean, it is definitely a concern. I don't know, really do, you, do you feel like you're being prepared for, for those kinds of things now, or? Not, no, not really. I mean, I, I don't think I really will be able to be prepared for that kind of stuff until maybe the ending days of college when I start realizing, you know, am I really going to be moving out of the country or am I going to be staying here and, you know, dealing with it here? I always, uh, what, what interested me the most, that's why I can decide whether religious studies or philosophy, because if I go into philosophy, the only thing that really interests me, not the only thing, but the majority of it is human human cultures and human nature and the interaction between different people and basically the different cultures. And when I, ever since I was young, even in the country, um, in, I'm from St. Louis, and I would like driving to different places because different neighborhoods, it's a different lifestyle. And I would just look out the window and just watch people and it's just a different culture in every neighborhood. It was a different culture. So you can find it within your own country. Definitely not the same as as a different country. But I mean, you know, if you go to New Orleans, like if you would have gone there right after, it looked like a different country. You can recognize it. So how about faculty members, any thoughts on international perspectives? I mean Obviously, in geography, it fits right in. What about in other fields? Is there a need for it, or? Since I teach political science in American government, it's quite self-limiting. I don't know that there's much opportunity. We do talk a little bit about uh, international relations and uh, the presence of war power and moving into foreign countries, but that's just such a brief uh, a glimpse that for all intents and purposes, we're sort of self Restricting in that regard. Mm -hmm. And I guess the only thought there, you know, you could, you know, maybe get something um, from published outside of the United States, maybe on similar, maybe not on American government, but perhaps, but you know, just to have, you know, a different perspective on uh, the American political system. I don't know. It'd be interesting, but it, it all just depends on the courses that we teach, how how well we can integrate. Yes. Uh, I, I would say. In political science, we do have an opportunity, maybe in comparative politics. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, in different which I, yeah, yeah, which I teach. Is, it really is important, uh, integrating that. A wrong perspective from philosophy, it, again, it greatly depends on which class we're teaching. Uh, right. Teach logic, uh, no. Uh, there's no need, really, not much need for uh, an international perspective, unless you want to look at the contributions from India, uh, which you know, have been considerable. So uh, you know, you look at the, the topic, but the main thing is really do we look at the, uh, the the topic as such, and look at how different contributions have lined up from different cultures, or do we look at whether the topic is even whether the topic is so uh, you know, centered on what we teach in this culture that take it to another culture and you find another topic altogether. And this is where I teach value theory, I teach ethics and, it's, you know, and human nature, um, where it gets to be extremely relevant from time to time, but that's when we get into some one of the most controversial discussions in value theory about ethical relativism. Uh, you know, are the values of other cultures, uh, are they just another way of being human? Or are there really objective ways of saying that we are more wrong than those guys or those guys are more wrong than we are. So yes, sometimes it's relevant, but we can't say it's always the right thing to do to focus on the international perspective, because it's not a given. Right, and I guess I should point out, I mean, I always highlight that in the mission statement, but there's all those other elements, of course, to why we're here um, at Mason College in, in the first place. I had a question for Nina. You said it would be appropriate in logic, but I find uh, Asians have a different way of approaching things logically than a Westerner oh, uh, does. Where, yeah. Whereas Westerner has a very direct or tree logic, where Asians are more circular and even Arabic ways of approaching it. Yeah. Okay. Let, 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 let me pre 
Let me rephrase that. Oh, okay. The way logic is taught at Western philosophy oh, okay. departments. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Because if we take logic, if we take, I wouldn't call it logic, I would call it rationality. Okay. If we, if we okay. look at rationality in different cultures, huge differences. Yeah. Okay. And that's fun. But that's not what a logic class would do the way they're designed now. Oh, okay. uh, we can expand that and teach, um, would you agree, epistemology? And, Absolutely. And yeah. then look at the international perspective. Because just, just the thought of, of going from A to B in the Western linear thinking, yes, of yeah. course, you move from A to B, right. but that may not be the right way. You may need to think A, A1, A2, A3 before you get to B, and that may be a cultural difference, yeah. literally in the way that you uh, take in knowledge and the way that your thinking is considered to be correct. Totally. So, right. um, yeah, I, I, in logic class, um, in, criti in the critical thinking um, as uh, elements of the class, I. I would think it's more relevant because you you would bring in different you, one of the aspects that you talk about in critical thinking is looking at the world from different perspectives and that a critical thinker uh, is obligated to do so so that would be a great way to bring in the international and, and that means we'd be talking about critical thinking versus symbolic logic symbolic logic I would really right. think that you go to so it, as long as you're working the system say. Uh, Aristotelian categorical syllogisms, that's just a system. It's not going to change from right. one culture to right. another. Right. But in critical thinking principles, for sure. Well, I guess as a geographer, it's always about finding the place to, you know, to put these international perspectives. Um, I think it's interesting, too, because it can be quite challenging, you know, because you really end up have to question your own value systems when you work internationally. Um, and certainly in my international travels, um, that's something that I've had to do. Um, when interacting with people um, who don't want to speak English, um, who you know that want to preserve their own language and, and, and so on, so it's I hope it's uh, interesting for you. It's going to be really interesting for me for the next four to five years uh, as I work on my um, doctorate. And um, other than that, uh, we can continue the conversation. But I do want to say thank you in the only language I know, which is English, and perhaps you can read the others. Um, and again, thank you to, to Nina for uh, organizing uh, this. And um, if there are any other questions, uh, feel free. Uh, I just want to share a comment. I, I just had a trip to Hawaii, uh, which is a part of the United States, but it really is it's this weird amalgam of being in the United States, but you really feel like you are in a different culture in a different country, in such a different landscape, and there are a lot of native Hawaiians still around who don't act like Americans. They, dress and have the customs and the language of Native Hawaiians. And I went to uh, visit this uh, sort of a historical site. There were uh, uh, a house of a missionary uh, from the East Coast, and, and the whaling ships had come from America in the early 19th century and, and made a stop at, at this uh, city, Lahaina, in Maui. So there were some actual buildings, this doctor who had settled there, and the same house, and furniture and everything was pretty interesting and the woman uh, in charge of the house kind of gave me this little personal tour because I actually had questions <laughs> most of the other tourists kind of peeked their head in and left and so we talked we had a nice chat and, and uh, the thing that I found that was interesting is I said well thank you very much uh, you know for for your time and your information and I shook her hand you know as we do here and then she uh, gave me a sort of a caress, a hug, and she pressed her face against mine. And the pressure uh, that, I mean, it, it would have been, I mean, I, I thought, I felt flattered, but it was just interesting. Someone in America would never do that, a stranger. You know, you might shake the hand and shake it firmly. But this, she pressed my face, and she pressed my face with really, really hard pressure. Uh, and I thought, now that's something I just learned more than, you know, it was really interesting that it wasn't, you know, uh, expecting to learn, but it was a cultural thing. Yeah. And I like, guess, yeah, I, I might feel like that. Like, they're really very cool. hugged, very close, very physical and firm physical yeah. kind of interaction. And you can't get that on an online international collaboration. It was not yet. Maybe in the future. Yeah. Um, that's something. But yeah, I mean, all that richness to a culture is exactly. that you can't right. really capture. Right. But you know, and even these collaborations, they last four to six weeks online, so uh, it's definitely um, not an ideal situation for sort of a long-term awareness. But. And another thing that I was thinking about, the online uh, environment, 
if you're in the country, um, you're, you are surrounded by the climate, uh, just, just a general There's kind the of, smells the even, smells, yeah. all of the sensory input that makes you feel the culture and maybe understand it from a subconscious level in a way that just sitting in your computer at home taking in information intellectually isn't going to give you. Yes. I wanted to ask you, you made a comment about uh, when you uh, are in Europe or wherever you're traveling, uh, that some people will speak English and some won't. Why do you expect them to speak English to you? Oh, well, uh, that's a good question. Um, if it's you're in a foreign country, why do you expect them to speak English to you? I understand. So, and this is at specific conferences that have been organized. Right. At, um, yeah, and it. so, um, like the one in Chile, and even that workshop where um, um, my my Spanish is about 30%, so I can communicate in, uh, in Spanish. Um, but the conference was in, in two languages, English and Spanish. But for the workshop that we had prior to, um, we, had Sp we had Spanish speakers and we had English speakers. And even the Spanish speakers who knew English better than my Spanish didn't want to talk in English, oh, which is a very interesting thing because here they have, um, you know, volunteered their time to come to this workshop, and yet there's still that resistance. And of course, it's my own fault for not knowing the language in Chile. I'm not um, trying to deny that, but um, there was even a discussion that we were able to answer. You know, why is it that people don't want to speak English, even if they know it? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, in, in that kind of context where it seems yeah. like it would have. Um, benefit at all to, to have any language to communicate it, right. but I think I mean they're sending a message a message and yeah. I've heard it I heard yeah. that message yeah oh, they are yeah. yeah and I wouldn't say that's broadly but I think um, you know the more and more um, uh, people I speak to uh, seem to say that um, there is a resistance to speak English mm -hmm. um, and for for good reason but mm -hmm. that doesn't make my job any easier I think that would be country specific mm -hmm. I would. This, I would not say that's true over in Asia, mm -hmm. from my experience there, that people will want to speak English. In fact, if you're at a conference, they would use English. I remember once when I was living in Taiwan, we invited a guest speaker from Japan. He didn't speak Mandarin Chinese or Taiwanese, and, our, and, the, and the chairman of my department did not speak Japanese, and so they sat around talking in English. So I would say it might be country specific. No, I think mean, it's even people specific, and it's interesting yeah, because yeah. you know the Chilean. If you look at the Chilean economy and how it's integrated into the world economy, a lot of the students wanted to do this international collaboration there because they want to use English. I mean, this is a job skill for them that's very critical. Um, um, so there's all different. Even within a country, there's going to be different perspectives and different motives for choosing what language to communicate in. Um, but that's always. I mean, with these international collaborations, it's always going to come down to the language issue. Um, to, to, I mean, to be frank about it, right? Even the translations uh, that we have in you know, English and Spanish, there's going to be some gaps there, and in, in, if the translator m might have missed an innuendo or, or, or something, so it's a, it's a big issue. And I, I've, oh, sorry. Don't go ahead. No, no, you had your hand up. Oh, uh, I was just curious if you had any difficulty with English in Switzerland. Uh, well, what's interesting is the, the who sponsored that conference, it's the International Geographical Union, and they have dual languages, French and English, so all of their publications have to be in both languages. Uh, but that's the, that was the fourth one that I've been to four years in a row that I've been to their conferences, and no one's speaking French. Um, everyone's communicating in English, and so um, it's interesting, but there wasn't any, there wasn't any concern there, because um, everyone, um, taught English, and it made me feel good too for once because as a young scholar, um, at least I had that language ability, right, when the other, other scholars were like, oh, I can't, you know, I'm trying to speak in English, I haven't done this in a year or five years or something, so um, it, it's good to be on this side of the language if it's English is the common language. Because you still, I, I suppose, that if you travel as an American in Europe, they said they want to speak English, everybody does, they, if, they, if they can, they will want to. And uh, you know that is regardless of how they feel politically, they still want to want to you know, show that they speak English. Yeah, and that's I mean that was everyone spoke in English there, even though it was supposed to be a dual language conference, it really wasn't. Yes. <clears throat> I think there are some countries in South America uh, that use the American currency as an official currency, it's oftentimes in, uh, alongside their own uh, currency, and so the lingua franca. Uh, of language and of also coinage 
uh, might parallel together, and the more countries all the dollars diminution recently may think, make them think twice about whether they want to be tied to the currency of our country. Uh, but because they've tied themselves into our currency, as well as into our movies and our literature, it would seem necessarily that they're going to buy into our language as well, for better or for worse. It's interesting because, I mean, just after we had this, we had this debate down there in Chile about whether or not someone should speak English or not, and we're in Chile, what does that mean? And, um, you know, we go out to the bar and we listen to Britney Spears and Beyonce, and, you know, and everyone, I mean, they know the songs way better than I do, you know, the American movies and all that. So I think, if anything, I mean, it's the entertainment industry that, that might actually be our saving grace to have people want to learn English because um, there's certainly political reasons that people are resisting. Well, you can't discount the internet either. Uh, all the discussions taking place in, in uh, you know, all the, the news groups, etc. Uh, if there's any kind of international audience, it's going to be in English. And yeah. Mongolia, a few years ago, Mongolia actually made English their, I think, their official language, and they educate in English, saying if we are going to be part of the 21st century, we bloody well better learn English. And so I think that is their national language now. Well, this is really interesting because on the, on the right here from um, uh, Korea, Korea Mathematical College today, there was a story about BBC News and they interviewed uh, people in Minnesota and there was a, a Mandarin Chinese school, K through 6, and the governor came back and said that they want to teach Mandarin Chinese in every school, um, whether or not it's realistic to or not, um, just because of the, the iron industry in Minnesota and its ties to, to selling it to China. Uh, and how they think it might be the language of the future, where it's, we're, you know, we're enjoying English now. So I always like to tell my students that, that they should go out and learn Mandarin Chinese, and a lot of them are upset with me with that. But um, maybe, you know, things might change, right? I'll be using different currency in the future. Anything but the dollar at this point? <laughs> Yes. I was just going to say I have a little bit of a unique situation. Um, I teach computer programming here, but I work full time at Yahoo and uh, program all day long and have a very diverse team of people here, but then up in Sunnyvale and people in India. And so there's the time zone difficulty, and there's definitely a language barrier among quite a few people. And, but we also all program in the exact same language. So it's like we speak this international language of C code that if you can't understand on a phone call, at least you can go and kind of look at what they wrote. and understand their brain thought at that point, so that at least helps. I, I was stuck on something on, on one of your first slides. Uh, this was, I, I don't know what this was, because you gotta just briefly tell what it was. It was, it was written TYE, I think, from 1991, uh -huh. the statement. So uh -huh. is, is that a familiar, a work that's familiar to geographers? Yeah, uh, and I think even, a, he's not a geographer, um, but he, yeah, from, familiar in the internationalization literature. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's, it's often um, who's pointed to to having um, sort of the um, post-Fulbright era, uh, when Fulbright started, uh, and they're, I mean, they're continuing today, but sort of, um, uh, with the growing global economy, he, his literature kind of is often cited. Mm -hmm. uh, learning to understand and appreciate our neighbors of different cultural backgrounds, okay? Uh, and to see the world through the eyes and minds of others and to realize that other people in this, of the world need and want much the same thing. Um, I think that you would find cultures today would look at that and say that is an insult. We will not be assumed to want the same things you do. If you try to look th uh, at the world through our eyes, uh, you, know, you will see things from our perspective, which is not yours. We don't want to be like you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think it's interesting. I mean, I mean that's definitely the tension out there um, that, that's going on. Um, and um, I mean, I guess my response to it is that, from my perspective, um, people who think like that aren't going to be interested in, in these materials anyway. Um, and um, yeah, but you know what? But but and, yeah. I, and I think I mean I don't know. Are we getting into a polarized world? Is it, is it, are we increasingly not being able to see eye, eye to eye? Um, is that is that what's happening? Well, um, uh, what 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 may be happening here is that. Uh, the globalization may be a unilateral thing coming from us, superimposing it on others, just like we superimpose everything else on others. This time, we're superimposing tolerance on others. No, it's true. Uh, I think and it's, it's, just, it's fascinating. Yeah. Is there is there any such thing as global human rights? You know, yeah. and maybe not. Yes. Uh, uh, it's something kind of similar. I just it's just kind of the opposite. I believe I read uh, an article that had to do with Switzerland. Um, a family came, immigrated from a different co country, a different culture, and there was a discussion of how Switzerland wants its immigrants to become more like the natives. More Swiss. Yes. Yeah. And 
the immigrants that were in the article, I mean, it, it was about uh, in a, um, in a family that came from, I believe, Turkey. And uh, what ended up happening that the daughter, one of the daughters, was becoming more independent and she ended up being killed by her family because of her choices. And it has nothing to do, you know, it's not about the religion or whatever because that was the reason, but I mean, that's not the discussion. The, the point is that here we say we need to look at, dif at different cultures and accept different cultures, but on the other end, you have countries saying, if you come to our country, we want you to become like us. You know? Yeah, no, these are tensions, and, and I mean, definitely there's a, the, the increasing nationalist sentiments. Sentiments are definitely um, a, a concern for this type of perspective. Um, and it's something that the really the students are going to have to engage in because we do have students. I mean, the idea is to have increasing international perspectives, but sometimes you have the opposite, where people feel like they become more insular as a result of these collaborations. Uh, and uh, I think it's just echoing what we're seeing in our own society, in the United States, in Switzerland, in Europe. I mean, certainly France is having that same issue. Uh, you know, the, their immigrants not becoming French and, and creating a second-class citizenry. citizenry. Close enough. Yeah, is it Friday or what? Um, but I mean, these are all, and I don't think we're going to be able to resolve them. But the, and I appreciate all these comments because it is, it, it is interesting to learn um, how how these different perspectives actually play out. Yes, Ken. I would like to question Nina's comment regarding the last one. You said that people would say, "No, we don't." I think you're looking at it too specifically. But if you look at it in a more general sense, I think it's true. What do they want? They want food. They want housing. They want security for their family. All cultures want that. But if you look at it, no, I want a big screen. I want a flat screen TV that's 54 inches. No, I would agree with you. See, uh, because I teach philosophy of human nature, you know, yeah. I have a model in one of my books. Okay. Uh, you know, who, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy's um, uh, "We're All Mortal" speech. Uh, that you know, what do we want in the world? We want security for our kids. Uh, you know, we want uh, we all breathe the same air, and we're all mortal. And there was a card because. Of course, a couple of months before I die. Yeah. Uh, he said, and that that is my motto. I I do believe we're all similar. Yeah, we are all similar human beings around the world. However, I do also know that there are cultures and individuals, groups who are saying we want to be considered as separate from you. We don't want to be considered uh, like it, it, if if you extend your vision of who you are to us then you are disrespecting who we are. No, no, I'm not denying and, that, but yeah. what I was saying is, is there any culture who doesn't want food, doesn't want water, doesn't want housing, doesn't want security for their family? Okay. So that's why I heard. They want it, but they, want, they obtain it in very different ways. Well, yeah. true, but yeah. they still want it. Yeah. I think that this, is, this idea is very idealistic. Sure, yeah, I And agree. beautiful, because, I mean, if we actually, if we can take it in, I mean, it can solve so many things like discrimination and racism and just, you know, so much stuff. I think, unfortunately, in our world, there are things that at this moment and for the foreseeable future are unsalvageable. For instance, I, um, I recently had an extremely heated four-hour discussion, <laughs> which turned into a screaming match. Um, I'm looking at this line to see the world through the eyes uh, and the mind of others. I watched a documentary called To Die in Jerusalem. And it was about a mother whose daughter was killed in a suicide bombing and she went to meet the mother of the suicide bomber. I lived in Israel. Uh, and I had someone who was very close to me sit there and tell me, but do you understand? Can you see it through their eyes? Do you understand why they do what they do and how, why they feel? And I mean, that's when, you know, when you come from a certain place, that's when I lost it. And I'm like, you want me to understand how the people who terrorize me feel and think? No. And we went on for four hours, literally, until like the wee hours of the morning. And, you know, and I'm like, I'm a very open-minded person. I have friends of any kind, and I mean, I, you know, like, and I told completely, I was, and I told him, I'm like, I'm completely aware of how I sound, and I'm completely aware of how, it's, how hateful this is coming across, and I have no problem with it, because, you know, 
this is something I grew up in, and there, and there is, for me, I was like, it's not like I'm anti-Muslim, I'm anti these terrorists I grew up with, you know? So I just think there's some things in the world that like, like for instance, somebody like me, I'm one of those people who when you like, oh, let, let there be peace in Israel, I'm one of those people who's gonna tell you there's never gonna be peace, because it's either us or them and it's not gonna be us. And I guarantee you there's gonna be another person from the other side, from Palestine, who's gonna tell you the exact same thing. So, and that's the thing, I mean, and when we get into these discussions, we're going to have situations where people will never see eye to eye. Exactly. Um, but I think I'll just comment that I, I do see this more as a basic needs, needs issue. But just to give you an example, um, for that Papua New Guinea um, Americans of College collaboration, uh, we looked at nationalist symbols. And so, in the United, national symbols in the United States, the eagle, the flag, and Papua New Guinea, their flag as well, and a bird of paradise. And, and so, as geographers, we get in there and say, well, what was similar between these ideas? Uh, and, and what's not, not what's very si different about our nationalist symbols, you know, what do they represent, what's behind them, and so I think that's, as an educator, that's the interesting part, is to, to just have an awareness and understanding, the knowledge uh, about our similarities and then also our points of departure um, and see, you know, and, and those implications in our personal lives but also professional lives as well. Yes? <clears throat> of course, in response to the comment from back here, mm -hmm. ask a Palestinian 1948, what they thought about their rights as opposed to the interlopers, right. uh, and you will get a very different uh, perspective. Right. For uh, sure, exactly. For yeah, sure, one hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. I'm also. completely aware of everything. Yeah. One hundred percent. It's it's a, it's, a, it's going to be. If we want to talk about it, it's going to be like a five hour discussion. It's going to no, go on for no. years. But so of course, I'm you saw aware that of film. It. You saw that film, but you also saw with the uh, Palestinian mother. And, and the or the two young ladies there uh, said, and they felt that the Israelis are also uh, one hundred percent. You know, I'm not going to get into this yeah. discussion because so I also is, lived really, in Israel. Well, I understand that, but, but I also saw the hatred in her eyes when she, well, when she was on, there. Well, on both sides, on both sides. That's the, I, the unfortunate part. Is one hundred percent. I'm yeah. completely aware of what's right. going on, but I'm also aware of the complete history. And I'm also aware of all the actions that were taken and the reason why they were taken. And I'm aware of the fact that Israel retaliates and doesn't attack on purpose as the first one. And we don't terrorize people. Well, you know, the other side has then a different interpretation of that. 100%. That Israel never attacks or, you know, never it only retaliates. Okay, so yeah, it, it, I guess uh, what an educator tries to do, and especially political science, uh, we try to look at the whole picture. All right, and that's what we, we can only give our, our students the information of the whole picture. As far as I'm concerned, they're, they're, uh, the ends don't justify the means. So mm -hmm. when they said in that documentary, when they said that they can, they, they can do whatever they want because they are being, whatever, whatever that happens to them, that they can take whatever actions they need. And like the father said, like, if we want, we can sing about it. If we want, we can talk about it. You don't have to kill about it. He said that those were his words, but they choose, they choose to Israel tell. Said that. He yeah, said that. Yeah, the Israeli said that. No, not the Israeli said that. The Palestinian father said that. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think that's right. I mean, and certainly as an instructor, I feel like you know, um, if you know, these obviously are part of my values that, that I, I mean, I feel it's something important, and so I can only give the information. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, made a sale as far as the importance of international perspectives, but how students interpret that uh, and what that means for them. Is really uh, what education is about. I think you know, um, as you said, as far as you know, painting this picture, and um, and, I, and we're certainly not going to resolve that issue. We're not going to resolve our sinking dollar issue today. But uh, I hope we did resolve um, my my uh, thinking globally and teaching locally at some level. Mm -hmm. Any other yeah. comments? Or we can continue this discussion. It's pretty vibrant, and I appreciate all the comments. It's really interesting. Any further comments, suggestions? <laughs> so y'all come y'all come visit me in Texas. Thank you so much. So